Axons Unleashed. G'day ladies and gents, Robbie Turner's my name, I'm joined by my main man, my right hand man, Ew. Luke is in the office with me, how are you mate? I am real well mate, really well today. Now, interestingly we've got an amazing guest with us today, I feel like I say that to everybody, yeah. and like, apologies to all those other guests <laughs> that I've already had, that you are amazing in your own right, but this is someone that we know, and this is someone that all of our listeners more than likely know as well. Yeah mm. man, well, what, a, what a fucking journey this guy has been on, I cannot wait to be able to share this with you know with our audience. Yeah me too, we are going to go on a bit of a journey, we're just said to him before, Hesto, I'm going to take you on a journey, and he's like, this is going to be interesting. Brother, <laughs> welcome to Axons Unleashed. Thanks, mate. Good to How be are here you, mate? Heston Russell, ladies and gents, in yeah. the house. Good. Yeah, we go way back. Luke, Adfa, Robbie, yeah, RMC. Yeah. Back to when he was known as Buns and Guns Turner. Hey, I'm, hey, I'm telling the story here. You, haven't, you, can't, you can't jump to phase two. I haven't even started phase one yet. Preemptive Listen, strike, mate. Preemptive. For those watching on YouTube or whatever you're sort of listening at, you can see that veteran games were on. So let's talk right. about that. Right, sort of look, look a bit of a bottom line up front, because yeah. literally we're doing this podcast what 72 hours after it's finished that's it so it's almost like we can do a live hot wash i know right i'm still sort of coming down from it it was a pretty right. epic weekend and thank you guys for being out there no, um, pleasure, mate. first ever veteran games yeah for those who don't know it was on the gold coast and uh, basically came from a concept of needing something to reconnect veterans train together with purpose and compete um demonstrating some of that excellence we had uh, in uniform and it was out there in the Number Bar Valley. We're talking about forming a team of eight veterans, obstacle course, tug yeah. of war, medical stand, ninja war, all this amazing stuff. And it, um, yeah, it was, we're playing in my head on the weekend, it came to reality. And it was so much fun. Yeah, I'm literally good, coming man. down off the nostalgia it from was it. Really eh? good. I think the thing that grabbed me the most about it is we've, there's, a, there's a heavy focus in the, in the veteran community about you know being disabled, recovering, and, and that sort of stuff. And there's, there's plenty of that stuff going on yeah. all over the place. Yep. This was about able bodied veterans. Yeah, and it's about, it's about putting a positive day on the calendar. And, and one, of the, one of the fellas out there told me that you told him that. Yeah. Putting a positive day on the calendar for veterans and their families to, to sort of hang around and work towards. Something to look forward to. And yeah. it's sort of, even though it's not quite able-bodied veterans, it's just about proving what we can do. Yeah. There's so much in the system for those who need it, who are seriously sick, injured, ill. I linked in with the Invictus team before announcing this. That is great for getting veterans back into adaptive sports. Mm. But there's nothing out there that's proactive and preventative for the highest risk demographic of mental ill health and suicidality, yeah. which is guys and girls under the age of 40. Everything's reactive to when yep. you need it or is skewed towards the older veterans. So this is all about, hey... And some of the guys and girls from the weekend, it's like, oh my goodness, I didn't know I could do this until I did it. And yeah. it's, as we know, mate, when we did commando selection and re recruitment, it's about mindset. So yep. you help people to realise what they can do, all the rest flows. Whereas everything else at the moment is so bespoke to little bits and pieces, yep. what I can't do and how I can sort of adapt to that. Yeah. And as you guys know, that's why I call the business Axons. Axons oh. are in the mind and Axons. You didn't know this? No, like tell little, me the story. Like little, <laughs> axons are like little tree branches that carry the spark between the neurons to fire the body into action. Everything's about wow. mindset. And you just said it. Jeez. Live and uninterrupted. It's like we prepared that. But no, we not. did not. That was amazing. <laughs> no, we did not. <laughs> How am I only finding out about this now? Oh. <laughs> I thought well, you, I thought you said you follow us. Brilliant brilliant segue. Segue. <laughs> I do. I've just never heard that one. That's brilliant. Mate, it's good. Um, my brother-in-law, Matt, yeah. who you met out there, yep. he's been an obstacle racer for four or five years. And he was just sitting back and we were going through that, going through the water, going up the, the ninja, ninja wall, wall yeah. with all the stores and everything. And he was just sitting back. He's like, Wow. I've never seen a bunch of civvy optical course racers work as a team. Yeah, right. I've never seen them get like the stores over there, et cetera, et cetera. He was well impressed. And that's yeah. the big thing. Everyone knows Spartan race, um, Tough Mudder, True Grit, you know, the raw challenge. It's all sort of individual stuff. But And this was the whole thing in designing it. Mate, I just grabbed a bunch of ideas from running the selection course. Yeah. And it all comes down to teamwork, communication, problem solving. There were some guys and girls out there who were fit as – but we just slowed them down with that problem skill sets. Yeah. And you, if you went hard and fast, you actually stuffed up technique and lost points. Yeah, so and nothing you could cool. do was by yourself. You yeah, had exactly. to work as a team. You were compelled to work as a team. It's, Absolutely. It's a really good concept, man. Yeah, I right. love it. It was such a privilege being there for the for the first one. Yeah, it was fun. I right? am so excited to see where this goes, bro. Right. It's really cool. I did a little piece of camera out the back. I love your your um, sort of ops manager, Sam. She yeah, goes, yeah, she's hey, awesome. Robbie, I said, you know, what's up, mate? She goes, You've got a bit of a look on your face like you want to do a piece of the camera. I'm like, I'm always fucked. <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm always fucking ready for a camera. Have you met Where me? is it? Where? Which one am I looking at? <laughs> so we did that, and um, you know, one of the questions that the you know dudes out the back that you know, if you're, a, what would you want to say to a um, a corporation or another business or a, like government agency? I'm like, you know what? Invictus Games started quite small, and yeah. look at it now. It's a fucking global event. Yeah. yeah. So those of us that got in as founding sponsors, yeah, happy mate. days, yeah. and I'm sure we'll continue to collaborate over the years to sort of come. But you know, everyone from a small business, a large enterprise, or a government organisation, you want to come to us with a fucking good reason about why you're not involved in yep, this going mate. forward. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think I said before about the veteran games being so much about what you can do. Like even on my own personal journey, I had this idea two years ago um, and we're looking to sort of launch it um, off the back of the withdrawal from Afghanistan, but then that obviously went to poo. So we sort of left that alone for a bit. And what has been just amazing has been this last year of bringing this project to reality and on a personal note, sort of proving what you can do. Look, if you have a good idea... Go find some good people in the community yeah. who will support you, like Axon's come on board as a founding sponsor, and then put in the work, believe in yourself, and you've got this concept. And, you know, what, on the weekend, I didn't know how the weekend was going to go until yeah, it man. finished, mate. Fucking and then, successful, mate. Yeah, it just stick awesome. to your guns because there's so many blocks. Like when federal government said no to funding, state government said no to funding, no defence industry came on board for funding. There were all these gates where Sam and I sat down and said, cool, like, do we just call it quits? Do we postpone it to next year? Do we do whatever? No. And then finally... That's not in your blood. Mate, <laughs> but when, you, when you're stuck behind the computer in briefs and talking yep. about something, getting out there on the weekend, I haven't been in that sort of flow state yep. since my time in service. Yeah, I talk man. about my time in combat. It was just in a flow state. I didn't care if I fell over, looked stupid. You were just like on and yep. in the moment. And, you know, the number one cure for all mental health is being in the moment. Yeah, and man. It brought me to it hard for the last two weeks. That's why I'm literally 72 hours out having yeah. like a an energy come down. Cause <laughs> yeah. yeah, I feel like I've had a big weekend on the booze or something. And now, now you're here with us. This is an energy come up. I know. So <laughs> you, yeah, you, you might need an extra 96 hours. I feel like I need to be sharp and ready. I need about four coffees before this. But, let's go. but here's the thing. Like, it's pretty well known. There was some interesting things going on in your personal life. So, like, so just yeah, take, before yeah. I delve into that, when, when was the concept of Veteran Games spawned for you? Uh, so when they announced, so what was it 2021? when they announced we were coming out of Afghanistan. Uh, and in the lead up to that, I had personally applied for Invictus Games um, just because I, I wanted to get out there and compete. I wanted to do something physical. Yep. But um, I'm not, you know, broken, injured or ill enough to do that. And that makes enough. sense. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I was like, there needs to be a gap that we can fill. I need it to be team-based. I need it to be annual because people fall off the cliff if it's not regular. So, yeah, this literally selfishly was something that I designed for someone like me and then went to a whole bunch of veterans that we work with and support, and they were like, yeah, absolutely. I'd be That's involved. something that I've been personally amazed by is your capacity to do with other stuff that's going on and keep this ticking over as yeah. well. Like I know you've got Sam and a bunch of other people that have helped you out on the back channel. Yeah. Like like me, it's not a, not a one-man axon absolutely. band here, yeah. but someone needs to be the director. Someone needs to provide provide that strategic direction and guidance and leadership to make, yeah. it, make sure that your vision is coming to fruition yep. here. Um, so, you know, quite personally, I want and to put the it on the record, you have just, you've maintained focus on something like this yeah. with so many other massive distractions of which would implode most other people yeah. singularly, let yeah. alone yeah. having multiple of them. Yeah. So it's a real <laughs> test to your own bloody resilience and, and, you know, willingness to just win no matter what, mate. Yeah. Have you have you taken stock of that? Like, do you yeah, know I, how, how impressive you are? Well, it's been interesting because a big lens that I've looked through everything, including those sort of you know, decision points with progressing with the veteran games has been like everything I do now carries my name to it. And mm. there's a whole bunch of snipers, including the ABC, sitting on the sidelines ready to just destroy me should I stuff up in any way. The risk threshold has felt heavier than I've ever had it before, yeah. and th which is impressive for me to appreciate that given I've been in combat commanding dudes in life or death and I yeah. feel more danger from risk here at home doing things and the fear of failure where it's as we all know failure is where you learn how yeah. to succeed better and stronger yeah. so it's been a, a fascinating self-reflection on that point with all the other things that have been going on and how it's been affecting my own mindset yeah for sure yeah. but do you do, do you do a bit of re reflection and take stock and like now you're you're 72 hours posted now you're like we did it it was successful people loved it it will grow legs yeah. over the years do you like do you do you realize what do, need, the journey you've been on yeah it's very my mindset is very in the moment moving forward me too so that's why i like having people like sam and all that and also the amount of people volunteers um sponsors competitors who are sending in just 
beautiful messages at the moment. And I was yeah. saying to you and Bulldog outside, we had like a whole production crew filming and doing interviews and listening to some of the interviews where some of the dudes have gone, this has gave, given me purpose again. My wife and my kids have said, you feel like a different person yeah. for the better. Um, it's when I have the chance to sort of chew on that in reflection yeah. that I'm really, oh, wow, okay. Because otherwise you're just like, right, we need to make it successful. We need it. My love language is acts of service. I need other people to be happy. And then it's like, oh, wow, like we really created something here. So yeah, man. You, re- re- you really I need some more time to process, but it's <laughs> happening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, think- we get that as coaches. And I, yeah. I insist that everyone on a Friday Friday lunchtime before they all leave here, I'm like, just take a few moments, moments, moments to yourself. Yeah. Think about the bricks that you've built throughout the week yeah. and allow that reflection as like concrete that flows back through the bricks to make them solid. Because yeah. guess what? You're going to come back in on Monday and and that's, where, that's going to be your starting point. Yeah, good on you. So, yeah, we reflection get, has, has, has helped me a lot over the years. And we get so, like, all of us sort of have the same mindset. We get so fixated on, because you can achieve a lot, and you get so focused on here and now, so what, what now. But it's that reflection piece that actually makes you feel deeper as a person, because you get to quantify and solidify and concrete your achievements, as opposed to, oh, they're just in a compartmentalised yeah, yeah. box back there, move yeah. on. Yeah. 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 Oh, good on you. That's a good, good practice. Well, no, I want, I want, I'm, I'm making an observation oh. of how impressed we've been of you as yeah, yeah. well, and I'd like you to also you know, start to recognise the, the amazing um, progress that you've made yeah. and like the differences that you're making to people's well, lives is pretty it. cool. I appreciate it. Thank you, mate. It's been a, it's been a journey. <laughs> I, think, I think one of the facts that I'd like to comment on, you know, yeah. before we move forward and get into your story, yeah. is the opportunity that we had as sponsors out there to be able to integrate and discuss opportunities, um, you know, with the other sponsors that were there. Like, obviously, yeah. the, the I guess the theme for the sponsorship that was there in, in the main was – you know, supporting veteran communities. Yeah. And so for us, it was like, you know, where can we support each other to be able to provide better outcomes for the veterans writ large in Australia? And, um, you know, and that's in the medical space, that was in recovery space, it's in your know, sort of home services and stuff like that. So, you know, to anybody who's out there listening, you know, with an opportunity to be able to sponsor this in the future, just take that into consideration as well. Like it created a huge opportunity for us. We've, you know, we're going to have other people on the podcast. We we're yeah. able to provide a much broader array of services through through refer, you know, through referring other businesses and all that sort of stuff, and that came from you know your your baby mate that you've, yeah. you've you know, and that created. That's that part of the plan. You hit the nail on the head before, Luke, when you said trying to put something positive in the veteran calendar. This was part of the piece where we come together as a community on Remembrance Day and Anzac Day, which are commemorative and reflective, and are usually you know um, signed off by boozy sessions. And yeah. there's not a lot of information transfer looking forward there's a lot of reflecting on times looking back and a part of this the veteran games is literally a platform that i want other brands other businesses if you are able to support the community anyway come along like yeah. we'll build the base bring your tent bring your people bring your ideas support the community like there's the only ownership we have is making sure that the event happens the yeah. rest i want to farm out to everyone who wants to be involved absolutely yeah love it all right veteran games is done, done. welcome <laughs> welcome to the actual podcast Warm up. Um, Warm up. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I pride myself on trying to conduct a podcast whereby people are going to hear things about someone. You have any podcasts you've done now? A few. And you've, and you've been on media a lot, like every time bloody Ben Fordham or Chris something Kenny or someone, out, like something, something always, always comes, comes up. Out, yeah. I'm like, I really want to try and focus on, we're gonna, well, you're going to disclose something to me. It's, it's only me, it's only the three of us. So no one else. Yeah, no one everyone else. Yeah. <laughs> And every um, ABC person I don't know that like everyone's <laughs> gonna be life. like, you know, I just learned I just learned something about Hesto today. Um Tell me, where'd, where'd you grow up? Let's start uh, this journey. Born in West Bend in Sydney. Then when I was a year old, moved over to the US. Dad was in the army and he uh, tested parachutes and stuff at the JFK Special Warfare Center in a Fort Bragg. And then moved back and moved up here to Brizzy, and I completed all my schooling, um, Fernie Grove, Fernie Hills. Right. How yeah. long did then? How long did Dad spend? Uh, he got in for twenty. He did his twenty years. Joined as a digger, became a bombardier, went to Portsea, um, got out as a major after twenty years, and then he got back in the year before I um, joined up. It was fascinating because he did the whole period where he never deployed anywhere. He went to Rifle Company, yeah. Butterworth, of course, for twenty yeah. years. Then he got back in, and when I marched into Adfa, um, start of twenty twenty three. He was there as a ground liaison officer for, I think, 75 Squadron. 2003. Going, not 2023. Sorry, 2003. Right. I got you. I got <laughs> you. You're quarter. not that old. <laughs> when, they w- when they went in to get rid of Saddam. So mm. by the time I deployed to Afghan my first time in 2011, he'd been to Iraq twice and Afghan twice. Yeah. <laughs> Which was so fascinating for me, having 20 years of being frustrated and all the rest yeah. to all of a sudden, bang, 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 bang. bang, bang. bang. <laughs> yeah, good. And that was my sort of first lesson on this whole Maslow's hierarchy of needs self-actualization piece because, you know, 
our family life was whatever. There's a lot of frustration there. But then I just got to see this change in my dad when he finally deployed and got to do his job for real. Yeah. 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 Was was he was he being a part of the forces? Was that a big inspiration for you to, to choose that career path? Well, I think he, he was my mum's dad, papa. He was a section commander on the hook in Korea. Yep. And then he was the first RSM of 8 hour and took him to Vietnam. Yeah. Wow. And my awesome. nana, his wife, was one of the first army PTIs and had to leave when they got married. And then... I bet that's it. Nana yeah. being a PTI. No one else uh, fucking knows that. That's the first one. Uh, that's the first one. I don't know. It doesn't matter. Oh, no. Just continue. Maybe. <laughs> Just continue. Hey, on. Nana was like five, on foot, your five foot four and she'd chase me around with a curtain rod. She, like, she was like, you know how, remember Star Wars where you're like Yoda, like sort of comes in next thing, he's doing backflips and shit. Yeah. Nana was like that. We'd stay with her and she's like all soft and gentle. Then you stuff up and she's jumping over a bed with a curtain rod. To is, yes. is that is that where you got your biceps from, mate? Is it Nana? I'll t- Nana. <laughs> the, the we'll bi- get there. The yeah. biceps story. Nana. <laughs> yeah. All the way going back, great great grandfather. A uh, great grandfather was World War Two. Great great grandfather World War One. So I think the long big th- history. Yeah, the big thing for me was growing up. I mean, not a lot of people know this. I was like obese, fat kid, grade eight and grade nine at school, yeah. and I sort of never had a girlfriend. Didn't really have any friends. Was like very very alone and very very sort of sad period of my life. Was that high school period, but the aspirational men I saw around me were particularly those who were in the military because yeah. I'd grown up with different military families and yeah. like. Tristan and all that like I would go down to his family's farm every school holidays to rouse about and do that and then he went to sort of add for uh, and to the commandos mm. and he was literally like I want to be that sort of guy I want to be that career path so I was yeah, very cool. young and impressionable yeah. to those that I saw aspirational around me yeah, yeah. um cool. did you have any any aspirations to go as a digger or you're always going to go and be an officer um I always want to go to commandos that's right. all I ever knew was yeah. I wanted to go to commandos I remember turning up to the um, recruitment center in like grade 10 and the sergeant's like, what do I do? I was like, I want to be a commando. He's like, all right. He's like, slow down there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I was, I, was, to jump. I was good at school and dad, so dad was the one who sort of said, hey, look, if you can get the grades, um, go in as an officer yeah. um, because I just want you to be able to have um, a few more opportunities if you want to. Because he would have experienced it like me, yeah. bombardier, sergeant, changeover, got out as a major, like having that experience across that, br- that breadth of your experiences there, yeah. he would have been like, all right. Even though he would have loved his time as a as an R double A O R, yeah, yeah. being an officer is like yeah. fucking a whole nother level. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, was, I said it to some clients last night on the co- coaching call. Both of them are fucking very very switched on at what they do and said either of you should go put yourself through Duntroon or where you get to senior NCO do the old ASBOX thing because yeah. you might not know you might not like this right now but I'm telling you the military was born for officers yeah, I can right. just fucking tell you that's how yeah. it works I did half of my career in either yeah. and I loved I love them equally but at the end of the day being an officer in the military is way better than being an OR because yeah, you're part right. of the decision making process yeah, yeah. not just doing it well, so I'm not I'm not yeah. surprised that your dad no doubt would have, would have guided you that way and it was interesting because my like self esteem was an all time low like particularly going through those high school years so being like in charge of people scared the crap out of yeah. me but um he actually had you know do you, do you know the guy gary mckay yeah he's written the book in good company yep. Yep. i had a good chats with him before i went my officer board i had all these good people saying look you know it's really difficult it's a challenge but go for it and um yeah i'm so so glad i did yeah um particularly coming from that place of uncertainty and insecurity later on in my career as soon as i had sort of rank and responsibility I just realised how much I love being able to use that rank to support people and make mm. the right decisions. This whole leadership is a service responsibility piece as opposed to this entitlement mm. piece where I think a lot of officers get it wrong. Yep. So very glad, but um, yeah, it was very, very intimidating as a sort of young teenager. Luke, you told a really good story about Sergeant Armstrong meeting you at ADFA. Have you got like, what, <laughs> tell us about your little, um, just the bloody massive, bally sergeant, because Luke, Luke thought he was bloody pretty shit on until he got his, yeah. you know, he got his got his first ass tearing yeah, by this guy. Him, tell us about your induction, like into, <laughs> was it as hard as what your you thought f- it was going to be? Well, probably uh, not. And was the winter cold? Was the winter oh. cold? Look, there are so many. I I've literally compartmentalised my first sort of <laughs> period at Adfa because it's just trauma. But um, <laughs> mate, when I turned up and they they shaved our number head number three all over, and I do not have the head to be shaved, um, <laughs> so that was trauma. But one of the first things I thought I was going to get kicked out because we went to uh, the war memorial um, as part of like the first induction piece, and Cosgrove was coming along to do something. So me and this chick Jasmine sort of stole away from the group to find a good perch to see Big Cosy when he turned up. And we spent that long that everyone else left on buses and it was just us two first-year staff cadets. Oh, no. I know. And we go down to the buses and you're in, like, uniform and stuff. Long story short, I had to go back to the war memorial saying, can you please call ADFA? They're like, who? I was like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> the main. And then the duty officer turns up and was like, what the F are you doing? I was yeah. like, 
I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I thought we were going to get kicked out, but turns out well, what then happened was this, uh, the um, division sergeant, senior NCO, who was meant to look after us, got there. Yep. But chewed for leaving two cadets of course. behind. Why didn't he do the bloody the Thank roll call? Yeah. yeah, who was this petty officer that I really did not like and did not get along with, and I just became his bitch for the next year. Like, it was <laughs> terrible. I got five charges in my first year at ADFA. Not a lot of people know that one. Yeah, there. Yeah. Like, you know, Good academy you, charges. That's all right. I came back. Character from, building. Yeah. I came back for the first period of leave. This flight sergeant, she hated me. The um, <laughs> squadron flight sergeant. I'd come back from... A weekend of leave. I'd been at Tristo's farm and I had, um, long story short, I kept my, she found my room unlocked because something was wrong with my lock and I didn't do it properly. I left my ID tag inside and I had a machete, which I'd used and stored in my car, all there. One, two, three charges. And then I spoke back. She charged you for that? Oh, yeah. One charge each. Motherfucker. <laughs> that's, that's ludicrous, man. I mean, you can imagine as like a first year cadet, you're also like, I'm going to leave ADFA with five, five charges, charges on yeah. my record. Little yeah. did we know the difference between like training charges and all that. But yeah. yeah. My first year at ADFA was that, not glamorous She at must all. not have liked you, man. Oh, hated. Absolutely hated. <laughs> Tell me about the whole thing about um, going over the hill to go to Duntroon. That was cool. Like, yeah. I so what year was it. that then? Six? Uh, when did you, end of when, 2006. End of 2006. RMC was 2007. Yeah. yeah. I re- I you got, walked straight in the second class. Well, I got through ADFA with a pass conceded <laughs> on my last oh, man. Army Rugby Arts, Bachelor of Arts. For oh. those that don't know, they just gaily touch fucking hands then, <laughs> like touch fists going, oh yeah, I got through with a pass conceded. Yeah, I sucked at my, ac- I just didn't apply myself to my academics at ADFA. I did, I did Indonesian yep. and history as my major and I loved Indonesia. <laughs> and geography. Another fist bump. Yeah. <laughs> I, loved, I loved Indonesia because you're learning something new, but I didn't care about yeah. George Orwell essays <laughs> yeah. and I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah so, man. but I played rugby. I found a gym. I learned I could yeah. like get bigger at the gym and yep. eat food. And I went out and have two dollar drinks at shooters. Yep. And, oh, <laughs> but you, therefore you would have loved the military stuff that was going on at Duntroon. Loved it. That, yeah. Yeah. Loved it. So like threw myself into the military stuff. So then when uh, I went over to Duntroon and it was all military. I, I've always said yeah. this. There are two jobs that I would retire for the rest of my life. One would be an instructor at RMC. And the other would be helping out to run the commando selection course. Like that is where I find the best value. I mean, that's that whole mentoring and developing yeah. the next yeah. generation. But I loved RMC. Do you remember when we first met? I don't know. I don't remember the exact time, but I was just there as your leadership yeah. instructor. Well, Rob, you were one of the – yeah, you, you were I was, run, I was running Shaggy Ridge. You sergeant? Not a fucking chance. Sergeant? Captain Robbie then. Oh, yeah. Captain Robbie. <laughs> Captain Robbie. What? Yeah. Oh, that's right. Jeez. Oh, hey, what's, as the saying, you only get one chance at a f- first impression, and that did not go well, clearly, <laughs> no, right? No, 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 no. no. <laughs> I remember because a lot of people knew of you beforehand because you'd been a sergeant at 4 hour commando. No. Nah. Didn't miss that as well. No? Yeah. You were a commando sergeant before. No, I was an artillery sergeant before. No, no, no. I knew that, but you'd been attached to. Oh, yes. I did go down there to support one of the activities. Yes. Yeah. So so the, the, mm. the cadet net was, there's this SF sergeant yep. turned captain, nicknamed Buns and Guns Turner. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't he live up to the hype too? Mate, it was I've never it is. Seen, it was, was the, first, the first uniform I've seen painted on. <laughs> <laughs> was Robbie Turner. The good news is you've worn that very well since. <laughs> hey, I, I, I too found a gym and I found I too found you could get big in the gym and mate, eat lots of good food. It did look like you stuffed a pair of Big Macs down the back of your pants, mate. <laughs> <laughs> There was a lot going on. A, there were yeah. a lot of questions on what is the ratio of staff to zipper to thread that's able to contain those. <laughs> because they also had this sheen when the sun was about four o'clock, it just shone in your face. So yeah, I'm impressive. supposed to be the host good. here and I'm getting bloody piss pulled out of me. Well, but no, you look, probably remember, right, my little commando beret up there. I'm like, you mean see that fucking commando beret? We're going to talk about leadership. Yeah. That's the original. When I'm wearing this here hat, we're talking leadership, yes, ladies and gentlemen. The original. You meant to, you meant to shave it in a circle. Oh, the mate, I haven't fucking done that bit yet. <laughs> Um, but oh, mate, it's, yeah. it was a really special opportunity for me yeah. to go down there because, as you well know, the most important relationship a young officer has is that with his senior NCOs. Yeah, absolutely. And if you don't know what it's like to be a senior NCO, how can you mentor other people to be able to engage with yeah. that? So, you know, you're another classic example. You know, both of you sitting here right now, I love the opportunity of being down there and being being one of your mentors and being one of your leaders and, you know, inspiring you to maybe go on and do, like, great things, which both of you both of yeah. you did. Yeah. Um, so yeah, mate, I, also, I absolutely agree. Being at Duntree and being an instructor was something yeah. I never thought I would go and do, but it was phenomenal. It was also very different because a lot of the staff you encountered 
felt like they had to maintain this really serious mm. sort of professional side, which you were able to do, but you are also like this larrikin as well, which made a lot of us uneasy because we're like, we don't know if this is like a, a, a lull to get our guard down yeah, and he's, he's just going to yeah, destroy us. Doing, yeah. <laughs> but, um, it's going to pincer us. But it was good. <laughs> and I do definitely remember that you were very, very big on always, without a lot of people, you can get some like former senior NCOs who just never let go of being an NCO and they're just like, they bring out those OR tendencies and yeah. put them down your throat. You were very good at providing that translation like you sort of did there yeah, before good. where it's like hey like you're not because it's very easy to be caught in the officer only training cycles like you're not yep. going to be alone you're going to have yeah. all these other ncos who have a wealth yeah. of experience um and you know it's really important to draw on them so mate after you threw your hat in the air where did you go then well i went up to two hour yep i went up to townsville which is yep. where i wanted to go um awesome unit yeah it was so good uh, under big ben james he was a ceo and then great bloke yeah, at the end of that year, I was straight off the team or put my three years of Indonesian to hey, use. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> I loved it. Cause I turned 21 at RMC, so I did the old heaves on the beam and 25, no big deal. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> hey, big boy. <laughs> <laughs> and then, um, yeah, after two hour. And to be honest, I didn't enjoy my first uh, introduction to hour. There were some senior lieutenants, some senior subalterns who were just so adamant on like, you're a junior subby, I'm a senior subby. And I mean, I never got that brief at RMC. No. I was like, pretty sure we all have a yeah. job to do. Yeah, yeah. and pretty and sure we're all, all the same rank. Mate, yeah. it was drinking culture. It's like, how big's your dick? It's like, come yeah, out yeah, yeah. and you do this. And I just cut them away. I like got in yeah. a fight on one of my first nights with these dudes. And I'm yeah. like, this is not that's for enough. me. And down yeah, to Singo well, to do oh, ROBC. I hate hearing that. Oh, it was shocking, mate. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, trust me, I've had good conversations with some of them before. Like, as we all learn 101, it's all about projecting or protecting your own insecurities. Yeah. And these guys, you know, I turned up, you know, Bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, fit, young, twenty-one, and you know, motivated, want to contribute. Yeah. Yep. And yeah. they sh- bloody yeah. shut it down a little bit. Yeah. Well, they tried to, but I mean, yeah. I got fortunate enough to jump straight into Fire Platoon Bravo Company, which is Bravo Company was relatively new, being raised. And um, do you know a guy, Richard Neesel? No, he was my OC at Adfa. He ended up being my first OC there. Oh, good. So, Straight away, well, we what, just was that a good connection? Brilliant, yeah, yeah, you know. And then like Tim Casey, who I went through Adfa RMC with, yep. was another one. And so we just formed our own little clique. And I had great a great platoon sergeant, great NCOs, and yep. we were straight into training. And I joined the footy club up there in Townsville as well. So I found those communities Connect, I needed for the personal side. I didn't need to hang out with these sort of agenda driven. Oh, if, yeah. if people yeah. are not are not your tribe, go don't, don't hang yeah. out with them. Yeah. Then. Yeah. You, yeah, you get that everybody yeah, yeah. everywhere. I should say yeah. it's just one of those things. And so what happened after that, mate? Take us on that. Uh, uh, that Timor oh uh, seven oh eight. Yep. Uh, we were over there when um, Ronaldo tried to kill the president, prime minister, yeah. and I was a QRF platoon commander. So I did my first helo assault force uh, in Timor, tracking down Chill on on. Mount Kaikasa. Nearly shot a pig. It was a fun <laughs> story. Jeez. I've written a book. Oh, f- it's all in there. It's actually hilarious. <laughs> yeah, good. The one time I went to Instant on Timor, I nearly shot a pig. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> With a P3 Orion over top, reporting back to camera. It was great. I it's could like, make a yeah. joke here, mate, but I'll leave it. Uh, <laughs> We've got this buddy. He sent over there. It's like, no, it's a pig, mate. Yeah. Don't fucking shoot that. Right. It sounded like you <laughs> coming <laughs> out of the bushes. <laughs> Trips in contact. <laughs> Comes bald on. You knew already that you wanted to go to the commando. So when did that start to become yeah. a reality for you? And the fascinating part was I... It was always a means to an end. Ad for RMC, even two hours, I was like, nah, it's just for me to get into the commandos. And then once I was actually a platoon commander, that's when I just really, I sort of say, you kind of like fall in love or like have this weird relationship with your team where like you do anything for them. And um, by the end of that time, I realised, holy cow, like this is the job that I love being a platoon commander and I need to learn a lot more before I'm then able to be a platoon commander within the commando. So... I originally had applied to do selection into 2008, my second year, but the CEO was like, no, nope, you need to stay on. We're going to give you – we were re-rolling DFSW platoon to any other platoon, bringing in the 50 cows, bringing in the javelins. Um, and I remember speaking with Tristo. He's like, mate, those are brilliant skill sets to have in the mm. unit, so do your time, get into it. I mean, I was 24 at this stage. Um, yeah. yeah, so I spent 2009, and the battalion went back to Timor. And so one hour I went to Afghan. So we had like half a brigade's worth of resources. 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 Yeah. And my pl- new platoon sergeant knew how to book everything on Tasmus. Like we went out to 250 men camp. that for fucking yeah. ages. I know, mate. Right? Yeah. got a fucking I, I, rash, I, yeah. 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 I used to avoid all that stuff like the play. Yeah. But I think the, one of the things I loved is then when you learn how to sort of really, you know, be a jet at that admin and start to weaponize it for your own resources, like – we went to 250 men camp. I got every single person in the anti arm platoon qualified on ATVs. We had 25,000 rounds of 50 cal armor piercing and sendry trace and burnt down all of Sector C. You know, <laughs> like 
<laughs> we're firing loom rounds for the 84 <laughs> and then putting it out with 50 cal armor piercing oh. and <laughs> Like, it was... I look back now and I was a dude dumb enough over the side like I'll fire the loom rounds all day and like piss blood for the rest of the night (laughs) (laughs) but that was living like just incredible eh? like you think look look back at that just literally having six 50 cows on tripods just putting out you know 84 loom rounds so when you did eventually get down to SOCOM when there's that many resources not just every now and then all the time that would have been a nice thing to have your way well the best part was we went went straight did select 2010 and um, I love selection so much there was one time where I nearly stuffed up my knee and I thought I was going to get pulled off but outside of that like I don't know why I think there's I, I do know why I've had enough psychology sessions <laughs> there's the, um, the the lonely sort of you know lacking connection fat kid Heston then thrown into these team environments where I get to be assessed on my performance and attitude each day with other people and all going through like the same suck that yeah. hurts that is where I'm my best. <laughs> and I love that combined <laughs> adversity with people who are forced to be yeah. with me and I get assessed on my actions there and then not my sort of social status. Yeah. So he has locked yeah. the door, by the way. You were not going anywhere. <laughs> yes. But you would have... friends are my favourite. The thing that I found most, that most confronting about commando selection was the silent running where you're yes. not getting any feedback. So yeah, you man. don't know whether you, the way you are performing, the way you're conducting yourself, the way you communicate, the way you lead, you yeah. don't know whether it's good, bad or otherwise. You just yeah. hope like, fuck, it's okay at the end. That's it. But I, you, I get a sense you would have loved that again. Uh, it's interesting because I'd spent the the lead up to selection. I've been at my uh, mum's house in Brizzy and this time I had like a, my nephew, he was like four or five years old, if oh, three or four years old. And uh, his favourite movie was Finding Nemo. I have seen that movie 1,700 times. And the silent running period for us was the Navex period as well. And there's this weird thing where, you know how you got Dory, which is Ellen DeGeneres' yep. voice, like just keep swimming, just keep swimming. For three days, I had just keep walking, just keep walking <laughs> in Ellen DeGeneres' noise <laughs> in my head. And that's the point that nearly made me go psychotic. <laughs> But what I learned, and I think Tristo told me this one as well, is like find a happy place. And my happy place was being back at home. Mum was just feeding me so much food because I was training with my nephew sort of watching Finding Nemo yeah. and just going back to realising why you're doing things and that's yeah. that intrinsic purpose. And mm. like I told you, I finished my job 2017 redesigning and running the Commando Selection course. And a lot of people don't know, you, you read the book, The Five, Lung, Five Love Languages, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. um, words of affirmation, yeah. physical touch, giving and receiving gifts, quality time, and... Um, acts of service? Acts of service, maybe. Yeah. There's five of them. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I probably got yeah, that it wrong. Is. It is. But, acts uh, of service. And that's replace the word love with the word value or motivation. That's the extrinsic motivational factors that people need or can make them feel valued. And things like words of affirmation, you remove affirmation, so much that that affects people so much and i use this with the correlation to covid covid really helped to bring out what people need in order to feel valued they got Mm. isolated they got so much of that physical touch that affirmation cut away Um, and i now know in my later life that i show love through acts of service but i feel love through words of affirmation and quality time being around people who just want to be around you so it was interesting on the selection course to really appreciate during the silent period times running period times and during the individual like navex times that is when i probably struggled my most mentally but I was able to go back to that intrinsic purpose when I didn't have those extrinsic motivators. Yeah. Yeah. And the best part is like the selection course, 80 to 90% of the people who come off the course withdraw themselves on their own request because it's designed to break down those extrinsic factors yeah. to reveal that intrinsic motivation. And those who are there for the beret, the status, yeah. the pay packet, straight away the brain will find a reason why there's you something very more. quickly. Yeah. 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 And it was so, like selection course, even Shaggy Ridge at RMC, I think, the shag, Shaggy Ridge food and dep- uh, sleep deprivation period hurt me more than um, DMARC on commando selection because... You're think, welcome. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think because on selection, you had a bit more of a leadership role, whereas on DMARC, you're just another one of the numbers. And, and you had one oh. chance to lead the section, and apart from that, you were just a fucking... A, 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 a bull ant, really. Yeah, and yeah. what I learned, particularly on DMARC, was I'm good being physical. Like, you can deprive me of food and sleep, but I remember there was one stand we had where there's, you know, the trailer without a tyre and you can't move it, and yep. there's all these pulley systems. And as soon as I had to sit down and use my brain when I had no food or sleep, I just went to putty. Yeah. I went to absolute putty. I remember going to my um, pack and I had the Colgate 2-in-1 um, mouthwash toothpaste because I just needed some form of sugar <laughs> to spike me. I remember like squeezing the whole thing in my mouth and then grabbing my pawpaw cream and squeezing it all in my mouth. 
<laughs> Neither of them had any sugar. I've got to say. And next thing I'm vomiting up like fluoro do- green <laughs> and my nose is burning from, oh. What are you doing? <laughs> learned a lot about myself on that period, eh? But that was good though. Dan Fortune was the CEO then down at Dundrum. Yeah. He was like, all right, Robbie, you're the, you're the bloody ex-commando guy. Let's let's go and redesign Shaggy oh, Ridge mate. and turn it into a little mini bloody commando that selection. Was good, so, eh? yeah. I lost so much weight yeah. on Shaggy Ridge. It's the only time I've ever had a six pack in my life, mate. <laughs> yeah. I don't doubt that. <laughs> <laughs> hey, so tell me, so we got out of this sort of training stuff here. When did you yeah. feel like you were a real commando and like you got your own boys under your belt, uh, et cetera? Yeah, 2012. So um, Afghan 2012. I deployed end of 2011 and took Julie Gillard over. I was her PSO. And then start of 2011, I went on the recon. We go forward to like mm. Delta Company and do a couple of missions when they were I was the opso over there then. I remember yeah, seeing you over there. Yeah, so that was, yeah, I tagged on with Mods boys mm. and went on some missions. And then we came in um, July, end of July 2012. And then starting to do your own missions it's fascinating i remember the first mission was just a a dry hole um you know no shots fired nothing like that and the first time you actually fully get into contact we had this contact into gore where it was you know proper shooting moving communicating blowing up dudes with 84s calling in air support dudes shooting dudes close range uh and truly being tested as a commander i remember walking away from that going like wow like we sort of did that for real and it wasn't it's probably my personality type. It wasn't like a, you know, yeah, fuck yeah, we did that. Like I'm a man. It was like, like all the th- all the um, ideas and stories you have made up in your head of what it's going to be like, and then you're actually there. You're like, ah, oh, well, this there's no it. more uncertainty about it. And yeah. I did do my job, and it comes down to just doing your job and knowing where all your dudes are. And yeah, you really did, felt accomplished. Did you think that approach uh, in those circumstances that you went in with, sort of your understanding of what you what you were thinking the situation was going to be going in, then how it transpired whilst you're in there. Do you think that kind of helped or hindered you afterwards process? I mean, down the track afterwards, I'm not talking immediately yeah. after. No, no, no. Um, I mean, I, I loved it. Like what, my specialty is planning. And like that's yeah. the end of the day as an officer, your specialty is planning uh, and leadership. And like particularly over there, it's the planning teams. Yep. Like all my teams would be doing their own planning. And the amount of times we just, the amount of time we spent pouring over the plan and refining it. Yep. A lot of people say no plan survives contact with the enemy. And I say, well, you haven't planned well enough. Yep. And I just okay. say that from experience. Like my platoon did 67 missions in Afghan 2012. We killed 117 insurgents, captured many more and lost one of our guys. And the most amazing experience of those deployments and that trip was literally choreographing mm. the enemy and making them move to what you wanted them to yeah. do. Like we talk about UDA, observe, orientate, decide, Sorry. act. Yep. Well, ASDA, act, sense, decide, adapt. We were so much like taking the initiative to them and pushing them. And I had, you know, Blackhawks flying because they were going to push over here and they did that and just had so yeah. much fun literally manipulating enemies' behaviours through the accurate analysis of the enemy, the terrain, yep. your own forces, tactics, techniques, and procedures and applying your own skill sets to it. But the most... Um, fulfilling and nostalgic part from me was actually getting to see and enable my team commanders my sergeants to go and do things i did one mission where we chased objective slayer for three days and i broke the platoon into two um my bravo my bravo my platoon sergeant with half the platoon and my one one senior sergeant with the other like 30 partner force each two chinooks four black hawks four apaches drones and everything and i sat back in tk and just directed it all from back in the base and just even you know, most of the times the officers want to be on the ground. They're trying to chase this, chase that, whatever. The amount of, like, uncle-level nostalgia I got from seeing them doing their jobs for real. Yeah. They'd been over there five, six, seven times beforehand. Yep. Like, and just walking away as better people, knowing what you can do, yep. having that mindset of that achievement and helping to sort of remove any restraint from yourself, that's... Yeah, I'd go back there in a heartbeat with the same team if I could. Yeah. Giving them that trust, yeah. giving them that autonomy, giving them that confidence to go, I don't need to be out on the ground with you. I know you guys have got your shit wired tight. I'll be here for you. I'm coordinating stuff. Yeah. Something goes wrong. I'm right here to make sure we can coordinate the assets and apply them effectively. Yeah. Geez, that would have, by you not being there, it would have strengthened your relationship. Counterintuitively, it would yeah. have strengthened your relationship with them. And that's the biggest thing I realise as an officer or anyone in charge these days, like your job comes down to risk, seeking and accepting risk. And the guys always knew like if something went wrong, like even if it's because of something they did, like I would wear it and yeah. I would go and interface directly with the other officers, my bosses, whatever, Whoever. to yeah. do it. Like, you know, you, you, you can't always try and be perfect because all that you do is be risk adverse and we push the envelope on so many things but the guys knew like if you could justify 
your planning to me and show me your planning, not just shoot from the hip, yeah. I'll back you 100%. And I yeah. loved, and particularly as you accelerate up the rank, I love to be able to have more and more responsibility simply to seek and accept risk and enable others to go out there and test their own leadership skills, their own planning, their own resources. Yeah. Yeah. And you get to plan at a different level as well. Yeah. It's like, you know, you're now plan like you're at that tactical, operational, strategic level. Yeah. Like you just being stuck in one particular area is not good for like you need to be you need to have that sort of progression. Yeah. You know, absolutely. you're a team commander because you're not there as the number one gunner. Like yeah. you're you're you're, you're you're whatever you're doing, like you're there as a between like did you get to do some company command time? No, you pulled the pulled the nah, board before my then. My subunit command time was uh, at over in the SFT, US. Well, S- oh, SFTC, of course it was too. Yeah, SFTC. Yes. yes, but um, you know, like even on the ground there in Afghan, like one of the missions I did, I had um, four Chinooks, eight Apaches, eight Black Hawks, a hundred partner force on the ground. I had 150 people on the ground. Mm. Then we had a troop of uh, American Marine tanks, four Abrams tanks attached to my platoon on a mission, like. The stuff we did was big and massive. And it's That's stuff a company or a squadron size yeah. right there. But yeah. it's stuff I've never realised until now. And a lot of the conversations I have, Rob, you can imagine, are when I've come up against some pretty arrogant, conventional sort of, particularly, unfortunately, infantry or combat corps guys who are like USF guys, blah, 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 I had this and that and the other. It's like, mate, I did three-day clearance, like, side-by-side side with tanks through the Kajaki fan. Like, if you want to shut up and listen to some experience, it's fine. But, like, I'm not here to compare anything with you. There's yeah. so many... The biggest issue I find at the moment with all this shit going on with special forces and accusations of war crimes and all the rest is no one's like grabbing and documenting all of the massive level of tactical and operational experience yep. we had there on the ground. Yep. Like that mission where Scott died with the Abrams tanks was October 2012. That was the first time Australians had commanded tanks since the Battle of Bin Bar in Vietnam. Yeah, wow. Well, but you don't get yeah. to hear it because yep. there's this sort of spiteful relationship between conventional forces and special forces because we got to do our jobs and because the government held back so many of our brethren from doing their jobs. Yeah. And it wasn't our decision. It's not our fault. Yeah. yeah. We, yeah. And, and we didn't make that policy. Instead of reinvesting that learning back in, like, mate, I finished my career when we deployed to um, Iraq, 2016-17, to fight ISIS and support the Iraqis take back Iraq. Where is all that narrative? Yep. We're still talking about Afghan 2006, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, mm. 12. Like, yep. Anyway. Yeah. Mm. So let's let's talk about that transition yeah, sure. now, man. So so the balloon goes up for you. You're like, righto, where I'm done with the big green machine. Yeah. How does that transpire? Like, how does that come about for you in a thought process way? Like, what were the things that you were not necessarily moving away from, but moving towards? Yeah, good. Good, good question. I like how you phrase that. You've done this before, man. <laughs> it's, uh, it's the story arc. Yeah. He knows it. I love it. There's probably three elements I talk about my transition piece. So my life, I um, finished um, running selection course, got deployed as the SOJ-5 to um, the Joint Task Force in Iraq. So yep. reporting up to a US two-star and handling operations in Iraq and down to Syria. And then... Um, the oncoming Australian Special Operations Commander was actually embedded as the one-star brigadier, and I was one of only two other Australians within that task force. And uh, I sort of really got to see... Sorry, and then backtracking, um, 2015, I was deployed for a year over to the US Rangers, yep. and I completed my fourth deployment to Afghan um, then, after Australia had withdrawn. So I was the first person deployed on Operation Freedom Sentinel, which took nearly a year's worth of ministerial approvals and mm. was just embarrassing at a national strategic level to see how pathetic we were at that, whereas I was over there with a US Fulberg colonel who's like, hey, you know, I'm going to tell my Department of State do what to do and he's going to go and make it happen. It was very interesting yeah. to see that. Australia has that bureaucratic pull over there in the mm. US. It was like a bureaucratic push. Um, so I got to see the big boy league then and then Iraq 2016-17 you know, I was going over to the US Embassy and having conversations about who we wanted them to buy the next tranche of, um, you know, special equipment from to make sure they maintain their lines of supply back to Western countries and all this. And then I'd go back to my desk and there's the Australian call sign saying, hey, we need to get a Bushmaster sent over here. And then Canberra's like, we can't have Australian vehicles being identified outside the wire. So how about we paint the Bushmaster black? And then I have to go, a Bushmaster is an Australian vehicle, whether it's black or in camouflage. <laughs> and someone in camera is like, oh, shit, really? Yeah. <laughs> like, just that level of whatever. And then that um, Iraq um, one star who was going on to be Sokost was coming in with this whole, the culture is what I need to change in the Special Forces Brigade because it's just a brigade. It needs to get back to being army and bootstraps and all this sort of stuff. And I was like, you've just missed the whole idea. Yeah. 
And at the same time, when I was in Iraq, I had actually fallen in love with someone who happened to be a man and was in LA. And I was still really struggling with Australia had just come out of the gay marriage vote and yep. particularly in the Defence Force. The defence was looking for ways to show diversity yep. and focus on people's you know, diverse elements as opposed to our entire career and particularly in the commandos is your actions and attitudes each and every day, merit-based, yep. not anything other label in between. So that sort of uh, – and then when I got back to um, Sydney at the end of the deployment, they wanted me to do one year potentially in a commando company and then they wanted me to be promoted and go down to staff college because yep. we're having this sort of attrition of officers. And I was like, look – I don't want to accelerate up the ranks. I would have remained a platoon commander and asked to remain a platoon commander mm. my whole life. I, I was still only, <laughs> I was, you know, 31 at yep. that time. I wasn't ready to move on. All of a sudden, I'd actually found love and I'd never literally had relationships outside of my work because yep. I didn't want anything to interfere with that. Yep. And I was disillusioned with, one, the leadership coming in as so, com so command and two, just the Australian focus, strategic focus and strategic leadership. So... Yep. I took my long service leave. Um, sorry, I had 140 days leave in my books. <laughs> <laughs> no shit. Yeah. And then I took my long service leave. So 18 months later, I never sitting foot again. Uh, I discharged January 2019. I went and lived in the US with Blake, who was my partner. We brought Barry's boot camp over here to Australia. And yeah, I just reinvented a whole new identity for myself. That's fun. Cool, what man. was the reaction of the chain of command when you put your discharge paperwork in? It, nothing. By that time, yeah. like I did it middle of... Um, that whole leave period. And like, this is the whole part that just reinforced it. I'd been pushed to this APAC position. I had some, whoever it was, like probably Army Reserve Lieutenant Colonel, like, and even the career managers, like, oh, we'd really like to deploy you again. I'm like, you're not listening to yeah. me. They, that, that whole personnel management side on leave just reinforced, like, nah. Like, as soon as yeah. you can't, you don't want to be on the run on 15, you just yeah. move on and get out of the way. I just yeah. felt like a number and a... You know, deli line. Well, um, we experienced that a few weeks ago when James had one of his mates go and visit mm -hmm. him at a at a barbecue, and you know, warrant officer doing really really well, like thirty one year old warrant officer. And when he found out that he didn't get his his CO didn't want to present him his warrant in front of the troops, he goes, "No, we can just do that down the sinus mess." And the seems like, "Sir, you don't fucking get it. Like you're supposed to present the warrant in front of the troops, and then the troops know that he's the fucking guy that you yeah. go to." Yeah. yeah. And when that didn't occur, unfortunately, buddy, um, old Jay worked out that the organisation that he loved so much didn't love him back in the same yeah. manner, and now he's going to pull the pin. And that's like, that, I get a sense yeah. you worked out that the... Is. That's that moral injury, moral mm. trauma yes, piece man. we talk yeah. about, this sort of sense of abandonment. And I mean, I even, I even, once I left, I went through my own sort of really struggle period, that 2019 period, and I remember reaching back in and saying, hey, I'd love to come back in and just support each year with um, the selection course. I even tried to like, hey, can I come back in for um, Army Reserve days? Because I completely discharged because I was doing some media stuff with Barry's. And next thing I'm pushed off to defence recruiting. It's like, yeah, you'll have to re-go and redo this course and this because they're just reading off a checklist. You're just like, what? Yeah. <laughs> Do you fucking know who I am? <laughs> <laughs> have you got, seen these arms? <laughs> <laughs> and then I got my, um, you know, discharge certificate, like sent to me in the, in the yeah. mail, signed yeah. off by some CO of one You didn't APAC, get a farewell? You know? nothing. nothing from the mess, nothing from well, the I'd, unit, I'd nothing. I'd gone on leave. Yeah. But yeah, there's no leave. like, mm, done. Yeah, me either. It's yeah. A, that's a, it's a fucking... When you don't get that closure, like I know you had... I didn't want it initially. And one, sure. one of my mates said, no, listen, fuck face. Like, yeah. I know you're in a pretty rough place right now. This You need to do this. You need to mark that that line in the sand for you to be able to close that door. Even if it's... I only ended up having a, a morning tea with my CEO, yeah. as in just my CEO and myself. Just mm. went to a cafe, sat down and talked shit for an hour. Yeah. Um, and that was the, the, the you know, me... Dismounting from the military, it's it's fucking so important. You got you to formalize it, and the Americans do it so well. The Americans like do it in full pomp and ceremony and all that. But um, and we're not asking for that. No, we're no, far no. from it. Well, I have someone stand up and go. This was Buddy Heston's career. Yeah. This, yeah. thank you so much, mate. Thank you, we mate. loved having you here. That's You've it. done such a great job. We wish you well in your next endeavors. Yeah. Here's a little fucking plaque that you can put behind you in a podcast studio one day. Yeah. And I've said that to like even the Royal Commission people. It's like customer service one hundred and one. You go into a restaurant and you have an amazing meal but like the server's just a wanker to you and literally kicks you in the shin on the way out, then you're going to give that place a bad review. But you go in there and there's a fly in your soup and like everything comes out cold and someone spills something on you, but like the manager comes out and the owner comes out and apologises and like gives you a gift card for next time, you're going to go away like fully empowered by that service. Yeah. That's all we need to do. We yeah. are so good at selecting and indoctrinating and training and deploying. It's just that customer service on the way out. <laughs> and what it, I yeah, remember man. this on the selection course, mate. We redid the selection course. 
we had so many people who, like you have 90% of the people who start that course fail or, or withdraw. And they're the ones who go out there and are your word of mouth marketing mm. in the wider Army, Navy and Air Force. So we reinvested. Everyone got an individual debrief going out. Everyone got taken through their own performance and got some like growth and development review and reflection yeah, and wow. perspective. That's cool. They would go out and be like, hey, I didn't make it, but that was one of the most professionally run courses and organisations and I want to do it again. Do you know, can I say that, that that's, I'm, I'm not sure if it was specifically that, but I certainly saw that with one of our young clients coming through who, who didn't quite, he got all the way through and wasn't picked up, um, wasn't selected on the back end of it, but he came out and said exactly those words, mate. He was yeah. like, this this relit the fire in me to, yeah, to be in army. He goes. He was only a reservist coming in, um, and wanted to go for, on the full time selection course. Yeah, and he was like, I can't believe how fucking professional that place is. I can't believe how well resourced it is. I can't believe how much everyone gives a fuck about what they're doing. Yeah, and and yeah. So he he became like the exact the exact avatar of who you're trying to create yeah. at the back end, man. And because it, it's I mean. Brene Brown, everyone, all these other great people talk about this stuff. It's about shame and this whole self. So many people have attached their identity, their self-actualization being to being successful in the selection course. And I would have conversations with them like, hey, like, what did you learn from this? Yep. We will never deploy solely as special forces. We need all of our tri-service ADF coalition brothers and sisters to support us. Like even I'd have conversations with my medics and my SIGs who all felt that they weren't you know, um, manly enough because they weren't commando verified, uh, commando very qualified. It's like I don't need more commandos. Yeah. I need specialists. Yeah, people. I need you. I yep. need all the other people that go into this ecosystem. We need to break down this whole, you know, apex is those with the berets because yeah. nine times out of ten we can't do anything without this whole baseline beforehand. We're good at just finishing the job. You listening yeah. to mate? Look at that blue beret up there. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> It looks pretty good. I like the 87. <laughs> I like the 87 squadron and fucking cat. 85, you prick. No. <laughs> whatever it is. Hey, right. let's. Um, <laughs> politics. Oh. How and why? And how, you got something else yeah, you want to so go through you, first? I've got to shoot, man. Oh, you've I've got to shoot. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. See you later, Luke. Go. Luke's. I've got a client call on that I could Unacceptable. Go. Yeah. yeah. Right, cool. See you, mate. There you go. That's the fucking first, isn't it? No, I Second. knew about this. I knew about this. Um, no, you're good. Do it. Got to work. How and when and why did you get into politics, mate? Because uh, that was like, I, yeah. obviously we follow each other closely and yeah. like engage and whatever else. I'm like, what, wowzers, there's a there's a part of your of one's one's career that I didn't see coming. Yeah, neither did I. Look, so uh, I sort of had my own mental health crash a couple of months ago, which is the first period that I've had like a good two weeks of just sitting in the hole and just reflecting. And what I realised is... Um, so recently, like a couple of months ago. Yeah, is that I what you're I yeah in right. July, I came back from a trip to LA and my head, and I came back straight to uh, Nana's funeral and my head just broke. Um, it was fascinating. Like I just... <laughs> old Nana's back in the game. Like yeah, Nana that, from Nana. Yeah, yeah right. Nana. Now we'll Nana. come full, full yeah. circle. She's, she was the last, she's the last grandparent to die and uh, my grandfather, uh, the one from um, Korea and Vietnam, he died uh, December 2020 and Burton Report came out in November and ABC accused my platoon of killing someone October. So that whole run up and all before Papa died and when Burton Report came out, he said... Don't let them treat your lads the way they treated mine coming back from Vietnam. So that's wow. been my sort of intrinsic purpose this whole time. And then um, he died and Nana went down the hill. But she's been so supportive throughout. And um, I just went for this period of, yeah, something just gave way. Honestly, my body was so hopped up on cortisol. Um, I was like inflamed. I was not sleeping. I was hopping myself up on coffee and sugar and alcohol and all the rest. And I just had a full nervous system reset. And as my body rebooted, my brain sort of broke. And I was literally left there just reflecting for a week. And it was just so fascinating, very difficult for me to explain, but I've never experienced that before, which I found also embarrassing because I've been through so much in my military career, life and death, but now I'm sitting here sort of broken by administration and campaigns back here. But politics came out of a year's worth of editorial complaints, um, petitions to parliament, contacting ministers and all that, posts, the ABC accusing my platoon, of being war criminals uh, and then also off the back of literally going down to Canberra door knocking and getting enough people to say they're going to cross the floor to win the Royal Commission vote in Parliament so all of a sudden I did realize the tactics I could apply to politics I got to meet so many politicians and their staff members who are some of the most unimpressive humans I've ever met in my life unimpressive unimpressive right well like, that's surprising as in, mate wouldn't pass day one of the selection course but mm. they're making you know, decisions for our country. And most of them, it's the staff around them, not the actual politicians. So I was like... So Hell. there's good staff supporting them? No, nah, well, it's, it's an echo chamber of staff. And mm. it, most of the staffs are like the bad clerk or the bad adjutant with assumed power from 
the political member. Right. There are some good ones, and I met a handful of good ones, but particularly from the big parties, I was so unimpressed by... Underwhelmed. Underwhelmed. Yeah, right. Their purpose was winning votes in public opinion. There wasn't strategic planning. There wasn't leadership. There wasn't life experience. Most of them have gone through high school to being in the young whatever party to then being a staffer to being a politician. There's no choreographing. There's no application of forces. There's no communication and leadership. Like what you described before yeah. when you were in- yeah. Show me the strategic plan. Yeah. Like show me your appreciation process. Show me your timeline. Show me your decision points. Show me any of your risk mitigation or consideration matters. There's none of that. There's when's the next media interview like what are the key talking points like they're literally prepared puppets half of them anyway mm, interesting uh, and yeah. that's the world you wanted to get in you're like I'm going to come in and disrupt this thing like, wait, that, well I saw I'm like hey I'm, I'm doing all this ground up solving these problems where I can why not bypass and switch the javelin to a top down attack and go in there and help to you know stop the problems from flowing down but what I failed to really appreciate was the true environment that is particularly the correlation between um, politicians and media and just how very quickly you can develop and control the narrative if you put the big bucks into media advertising and all the rest. So, I had that same realisation. I followed the Brittany Higgins case quite closely oh, yeah. for some reason, for no reason for some reason. I'm like, there's got to be something going on here. So I've listened to all the Sky News and watched the bloody, you know, Royal Com- not the Royal Commission, but all the, the um, inquiry. The inquiry into it. Yeah. And I had a massive realisation that the conversations that were going on were shaping things around media releases and what you know what what the media was going to be able to put forward yeah. was when they would inject it, the next part of the information or the story. Yeah, that's and it. it was fascinating to see. Well, it's ID&I, information dominance, information dominance and influence. It's the IO campaign, and that's the sad reality is that. But they're playing with people's lives by doing that. That's, literally, I, I know what yeah. it is. I know what they were doing, but yeah. I'm like, surely that shit doesn't go on when someone might fucking go the high jump for instance yeah exactly so it was, it was just fascinating to watch I, I was I was sort of slowly putting the pieces together yeah um, but yeah even no, you and now saying and about that's it. what I got to see with the whole ABC piece so I'd spent a whole year trying to go through every formal channel you can imagine coming from the military you're like there's a system there's a process there's a hierarchy and I was ticking all the boxes and doing everything diligently and still being met with absolute belligerent resistance slash mis and disinformation so I was like, right, next part of my mania. And my whole mania came from wanting to defend and clear the names of my lads, including Scott, that lost overseas. So I just just kept going. And um, I didn't have enough people around me sort of going, hey, well, 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 do you want to do this? And the people I did have, I'm just able to say, yep, you know, I can, when I get a head of steam up, it's pretty. you'd be the same, mate. You're hard to sort of stop. It's belief. Yeah. When you believe in something, then you've got that compelling heart, fashion behind it. Like, it's a fucking no-brainer. So Kelly, who's just started with us recently, we walked across the road about three weeks ago. She goes, RT, oh, I've seen there's been a few people sort of come and go with Axon over the last 18 months. She goes, what sort of keeps you going the whole time? And instantly I'm like, belief. Yeah. Belief in who we are, belief in why I established the business, belief in the difference that we make in people's lives. Yeah. And I get a sense you're no doubt exactly yeah. the same. Yeah, oh, no, absolutely. And like, particularly when there's still this deep down responsibility I carry and this is where I try and push on to so many other old and new officers is that if we were just all still responsible and connected with our guys from service like I'm adamant we wouldn't be in the mental ill health and suicide rate we'd be at because we just lose contact so quickly and I still try and maintain contact with as much as my dudes who want to be in contact and I still carry this deep responsibility to defend that Uh, and at the end of this ABC court case I'm finally going to feel like I've done that and just be able to release from Mm -hmm. that. But politics came from thinking that that was the ultimate step I needed to make. Um, And blessing in disguise, thank God I didn't succeed because I would just be another sort of ungrounded, potentially unstable person sitting there in parliament. And it made me really realise that I need to go out there and ground myself and establish myself in community, in family, in things that will keep me anchored when you get carried away. And it's so easy to get carried away and inspired by the affirmation you get from media and all sorts of random people as I've found myself getting mm. distracted over the last few years. Yeah. How's that been for you, like in, living in a PID status as we did? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I, I had, everyone's got their own aliases on bloody social media or whatever. Because yeah. even though the policy is you can't have social media, then but there's a fucking wave of communication with young people that you just can't stop. Yeah. It's funny, uh, funny story. When, when I got out in 2013, I changed my name, of course, to Robbie Turner, but I was known as Romeo Tango before that. Oh, yeah. And my wife's auntie, she goes, I oh, see you're seeing, a, you're seeing a guy called Robbie now. What happened to Romeo? Romeo, he's a, he would seem like a nice guy. Oh and she's goodness. like, it's the same fucking bloke. That's mate. amazing. <laughs> but it, so yeah. to go from a yeah. relatively in the shadows yeah. to like where both of us are now in our yeah. respective fields, it's yeah. it takes a little bit of getting used to, doesn't it? it like does. saying before, I'm like, I'm camera ready. There are no dramas. I'm used to it now, but it's not something that come naturally and easy to me. You're an awesome speaker. How, do you, how did you get so good in speaking in front of the camera? I think uh, speaking just comes down to like – 
briefing and delivering orders. So that first year uh, after passing the commando selection course, I was on TAG, Tactical Assault Group, and I was the assault platoon commander. So the other platoon did most of the PSDs. And I'd find myself giving, you know, detailed, meticulous briefs to all different agencies combined together. Mm. and Just Over and over and over again. And yeah. I always set myself, you know, like you memorise the mission twice, I'd always set myself to like that was the time where you had to demonstrate the confidence, the professionalism of not only yourself but now, like the second commander regiment unit I'd always wanted to be a part of. And then missions overseas in Afghan, like I never had to refer to the um, PowerPoints because the whole thing was we we're about to go out and ask these guys to risk their lives I need to be able to like demonstrate that I know the plan and give anyone that next level of confidence that they need. Yeah. And everyone, the guys always say there was like, there was Hesto who was like with us shooting, moving, having fun. Then there was like Heston. It's like when you're in Heston mode and you were briefing, like I was known as a brilliant briefer. Good. And it comes down to knowing your shit. You're not trying to sell something mm. and appreciating why you need to be good at giving that brief. Yeah. And you'd be the same, mate. Like you said beforehand, belief. belief if you believe yeah. in what you're doing, take the time to actually do rehearsals and just speak from a place of authenticity, um, actually. And then even during one of my first sort of media um, cycles I got into, old Alan Jones sort of called me up and he said, Heston, the whole um, purpose of communication is to be understood. Because I found myself getting carried away with big words, being a bit of a sesquipedalian and all this. And he's like, imagine you're speaking to the bus driver. Your job is to communicate so they can understand your message. And as soon as I stopped trying to think I needed to sound intelligent while doing that and just dumb it down to the base simple words that came to me, mm. I feel like that unlocked a whole extra level of my mm. ease in communication as well. Luke will hate this, but he still speaks a bit officer-ish. Yeah. Like he's, he's, he's very, very articulate and yeah. he does know a lot of big words. Yeah. But um, yeah, I guess that's something. Hey, Lukey, when you're listening to this, mate, you need to get better at just dumbing things down a little bit. Dumb it down, mate. Bus driver. Speaking of the bus driver. There's some smart bus drivers out there, but Indeed. the whole thing is just to communicate. Mate, what's next? Um, this is something I don't know. So veteran games are just finished what's yeah. the next focus for like you know when you when you book a holiday and you come back from a holiday what are you supposed to do book another one yeah now i know you're already probably looking at a few dates in you know next year for whatever vet, yeah. you know vg yeah. part two is going to be yeah and absolutely we're going to be there with you yeah what do you do in the meantime yeah good question so veteran games is absolutely happening again next year around somewhere in august or slash much a bit earlier in september um, this ABC court case uh, is finished and we're just awaiting the judge's verdict. Right. So Have the, they given any sort of time frame for that? The judge has gone into his next trial, which finishes mid-November. So probably somewhere around then. He wanted to get Jesus. it out before the end right. of this year. Right. So that's going to be the start gun. On hope, he, hope he bloody remembers everything yeah. that was said. No, he does. He's, <laughs> yeah. he's a smart dude and he's got some good associates with him. Great. That's going to be the start gun on sort of a bit of a final phase where I want to launch a um, survey to actually have public interest come from the public to stop these accusations going through the media and require them to be conviction before they're able to be reported on because it's just destroying people's lives, particularly those in the, in the Special Forces community. Um, then I can finally also publish my book. I got commissioned by a company to write a book a year and a half ago and it's all had to be on hold um, during this ABC court case. Um, I heard you mention that about an hour ago. You said yeah, I've written a book. I'm like, I haven't mate, seen no fucking one, book. One yet. of the most cathartic – that reflection piece – Literally picking up that book and rereading it, and I've been editing it myself for the last year. Of course. When this ABC court case stuff happened, the um, big company withdrew their support for it, but I have and own the finished book. So good. be good to control your own narrative, control your own story, because, again, even in taking on some of the media, there's been a lot of stories being put out there that are just absolutely untrue. So I want to then get back into just some public speaking off the back of that. I love going and just telling people some of my story including all the fuck-ups along the way, to help basically that you know, younger potential Heston Russell out there to not have that uncertainty, to not be the only person holding themselves back. Mm. And then come back for the Veteran Games to have that sort of passion project for the community. Yeah. You've got such a vibrance, you've got such an energy, you've got such a presence about you, mate. I know that I can speak for you know millions of other people out there that follow you actively, follow you ambitly, take a bit of an interest every now and then. Everyone is listening to this podcast right now. Thank you so much for coming on. No, my Axons pleasure, mate. Unleashed, mate. I really enjoyed having a bit of a chat with you. So Likewise. Yeah, there you go, ladies and gents. It's been a long time coming, Daniel, hasn't it, to get uh, to get Hesto here. And, and certainly when I did reach out to you a number of months ago, you're like, look, bro, I'm in the middle of an ABC thing. I'm like, I know. <laughs> He's like, my lawyers have sort of said, come back after that's finished so, easy. Yeah. so uh here we are mate but good luck with it all and uh you know who knows it might even be a you know version two let's do yeah. another podcast after vg2 yeah let's do it let's i think i'll just come up, come up with an acronym that you can use vg2 VG. well vg24 will be oh even better yeah there we go thanks brother thanks, see Robbie. you soon cheers